hi and good evening i like to welcome you back to palm praise too we are going to get right back into the lies my teacher told me we are uh, through the introduction we are now in chapter one which is handicapped by history and it goes like this this is take seven and certainly before I get started, peace and blessings be upon you and your family this evening. And take seven reads as such. What passes for identity in America is a series of myths about one's heroic ancestors, James Baldwin. One is astonished in the study of history at the reoccurrence of the idea that evil must be forgotten, distorted, skimmed over. We must not remember that Daniel Webster got drunk, but only remember that he was a splendid constitutional lawyer. We must forget that George Washington was a slave owner. And simply remember the things we regard as credible and inspiring. The difficulty, of course, with this philosophy is that history loses its value as an incentive, an example. It paints perfect men and noble nations, but it does not tell the truth. W.E.B. Du Bois. By idolizing those whom we honor, we do a disservice both to them and to ourselves. We fail to recognize that we could go and do likewise. Charles V. Willie. Now this chapter is about heroification, a degenerative process, much like clarification, that makes people over into heroes. Through this process, our educational media turns flesh and blood individuals into pious perfect creatures without conflicts, pain, credibility, or human interests. Many American history textbooks are stunned with biographical vignettes of the very famous Land of Promise devotes a box to each president. And the famous, the challenge of freedom provides, did you know, boxes about Elizabeth Blackwell, the first woman to graduate from medical school in the United States, and Lorraine Hansberry, Arthur of A Raisin in the Sun, among many others. In themselves, vignettes are not a bad idea. They instruct by human example. They show diverse ways that people can make a difference. They allow textbooks to give a space to characters such as Blackwell and Hansberry, who relieve what would other, otherwise excuse me, be a monolithic parade of white male political leaders. Biographical vignettes also provoke reflections as to who our purpose in teaching history. Is Chester A. Arthur more deserving of space than, say, Frank Lloyd Wright? Hmm. Who influences us more today? Wright, who invented the carport and transformed domestic architectural spaces, our author who um, signed the first Civil Service Act. 
cool rise to prominence provides more drama. Blackwells or George H. W. Bush. The latter born with the Silver Senate seat in his month. The choices are debatable, but surely textbooks should include some people based not only on what they achieved, but also on the distance they traversed to achieve it. We could go on to third and fourth guess the list of heroes in textbooks pantheons. My concern here, however, is not who gets chosen, but rather what happens to the heroes when they are introduced into our history textbooks and classrooms. Two 20th century Americans provide case studies of herofication, Woodrow Wilson and Helen Keller. Wilson was unarguably an important president, and he received extensive textbook coverage. Keller, on the other hand, was a little person who pushed through no legislation, changed the course of no scientific discipline, declared no war, only one of the history textbooks I surveyed includes her photograph. Most books don't even mention her. You know who she is? Hmm. I, sur I surveyed. Let me get back on point. Okay. Most books don't even mention her, but teachers love to talk about Keller and often show audiovisual materials of recommended biographies that present her life as exemplar exemplary. All this intention ensures that students retain something about both of these historical fi figures, but they may be no better off for it. Herofication so distorts the lives of Keller and Wilson and many others that we cannot think straight about them. Teachers have held up Helen Keller, the blind and deaf girl who overcame her physical handicaps as an inspiration to generations of school children. Every fifth grader knows the scene in which Anne Sullivan spells water into young Helen's hand at the pump. At least a dozen movies and film strips have been made on Keller's life. Each yields its version of the same cliché. A McGraw-Hill educational film concludes, the gift of Helen Keller and Ann Sullivan to the world is to constantly remind us of the wonder of the world around us and how much we owe those who taught us what it means. For there is no person that is unworthy or incapable of being helped. And the greatest service any person can make us is to help another reach true potential. To draw such a bland maximum from the life of Helen Keller, historians and filmmakers have disregarded her actual biography and left out the lessons she specifically asks us to learn from it. Hmm. Keller, who struggled so valiantly to learn to speak, has been made mute by history. The result is that we really don't know much about her. Over the past 20 years, I've asked hundreds of college students who Helen Keller was and what she did. All know that she was blind and a deaf girl. Most remember that she was befriended by a teacher. Ann Sullivan and learned to read and write and even to speak. Some can recall rather minute details of Keller's earlier life that she lived in Alabama, 
that she was unruly and without manners before Sullivan came along and so forth. A few know that Keller graduated from college, but about what happened next, about the whole of her adult life, they are ignorant. A few students venture that Keller became a public figure or a humanitarian, perhaps on behalf of the blind or deaf. She wrote, didn't she? Or she spoke. Conjures without content. Keller, who was born in 1880, graduated from Radcliffe in 1904 and died in 1968. To ignore the 64 years of her adult life or to encapsulate them with the single word humanitarian is to lie by omission. The truth is that Helen Keller was a radical socialist. She joined the <clears throat> Socialist Party of Massachusetts in 1909. She had become a social radical even before she graduated from Radcliffe and not she emphasized because of her teaching available there. After the Russian Revolution, she sang the praises of the new communist nation. In the East, a new star is risen. With pain and anguish, the old order had given birth to the new. And behold, in the East, a man-child is born. Onward, comrades, all together. Onward to campfires of Russia. Onward to the coming dawn. Keller hung a red flag over the desk in her study. Gradually, she moved to the left of the Socialist Party and became a wobbly, a member of the Industrial Workers of the World, IWW. The Sindalist Union persecuted by Woodrow Wilson. I do, I do have a picture. Let's see if you can see that picture. I'm going to bring it a little close. There is a picture. And at the bottom of the picture, this is what it reads. Always a voice for the voiceless. Helen Keller championed woman suffrage. Her position at the head of this 1912 demonstration show, her celebrity status as well as her commitment to the cause. The shields are all from western states where women were already voting. Keller's commitment to socialism stemmed from her experience as a disabled person and from her sympathy for others with handicaps. She began by working to simplify the alphabet for the blind, but soon came to realize that to deal solely with blindness was to treat symptom, not cause. Through research, she learned that blindness was not distributed randomly throughout the population but was concentrated in the lower class. Men who were poor might be blinded in industrial accidents or by inadequate medical care. Poor women who became prostitutes faced the additional danger of syphilitic blindness. Thus, Keller learned how the social class system controls people's opportunities in life. Sometimes determining even whether they can see. Keller's research was not just book learning. I have visited sweatshops, factories, crowded slums. If I could not see, I could smell it. And that does complete this take of the introduction, which is take seven. Stay tuned for take number eight of the lies my teacher told me. And until I speak with you again, peace 
and be blessed. Talk to you later. Later, y'all.